these are some of the most disgusting dishes to have ever been served on Hell's Kitchen. And this dish was so bad that Ramsay refused to taste it. It was in season 9's Chicken Creation Challenge. Each chef had 5 minutes to grab a chicken inside the pen and then choose an ingredient out of those available to create 4 chicken dishes. You only have one lonely chicken. When you cut that chicken up, make sure you have a portion that is good enough to show off that dish. The judges were Jen Garcia from People Magazine and Dave Carger from Entertainment Weekly Magazine. Monterey pulled the chicken off the grill, thinking it was cooked perfectly. But then, this is what happened. Wow. Ramsey, noticing something was amiss, turned to Tommy, his partner, and asked, The chicken, please. Tommy then revealed Monterey's costly mistake, but he quickly reassured everyone that the dropped part hadn't made it to the plate. The cutting board, and the end piece fell. Onto the floor. Yes. Unfortunately, Ramsey wasn't in the mood to even taste the dish after what had happened. Half the chicken is missing. So Jamie ended up snagging the victory in this round, leaving the score at two apiece. Monterey, realizing the magnitude of his error, stepped up and took responsibility for the whole thing. Ramsey's refusal to taste the dish clearly highlighted the severity of the mistake, and overall it was a lesson learned from Monterey about the importance of precision. And, you know, not dropping things. Hey, at least be glad you didn't have to taste Gina and Carrie's dish, which ended up completely raw. I was on the team with Carrie, and the chicken was completely raw in the center. I'm sorry, chef. Up next, how about giving Dave's crepe a taste? Or, on second thought, let me just have Ramsay describe it. I asked for a crepe, not a plate of crap. <laughs> yeah. It all went down in Season 6's Crepe Challenge, and the task was to whip up four crepes, each for a different mealtime. Breakfast, lunch, dinner, and dessert. It was honestly pretty amusing to see everyone repeatedly stumble and fumble while trying to create their perfect crepes. Well, what's astonishing is that, despite the struggle, they somehow managed to produce something pretty decent. Well, that is, everyone except Dave. Dave's attempt at a cream cheese and mixed berry crepe was, well, royally f***ed. Why is it full of gunk around the outside? It just looked like shit. not gonna lie. It looks like a plate of diarrhea. Not quite appetizing, huh? Let me do you one better. Not appetizing at all. And Van had some words of wisdom for us. It looks like diarrhea, man. I ain't eating that shit. Ramsey listened and flat out refused to taste it, and that's saying something. It was one of those rare moments when Sabrina managed to outdo Dave in the kitchen. And moreover, it was one of the few moments where the one-armed bandit took an L. Be glad you're tasting a winner's dish. Well, moving on, what we have here is by far the tastiest dish ever made on the show. Made by the greatest chef ever. Ah! Raj, who was pretty confident about his culinary experience, proudly served up his seafood and vegetable pancake. I am an executive chef, and I began cooking when I was 14 years old. Show me your dish. I was always the best cook in the kitchen, so I can't see why this would be any different. Yeah, yeah, I get it. It's a thing. Seafood pancakes. But as soon as Ramsay laid eyes on it, he was in for a surprise, because this so-called pancake looked nothing like the real deal. What? That is a pancake? It's a, yeah. Does that look like a pancake? On top of that, it was practically swimming in oil. On brand for a seafood pancake, but that doesn't make it much better. Oh, it's going for a piss. A pancake that pisses. Surprisingly, despite its appearance, Ramsay did find the seafood's taste pretty appealing. It's a shame because seafood actually tastes quite nice inside. However, the shocking presentation was a deal breaker for him, and he couldn't bring himself to award Raj a point for it. So the point went to Sabrina. You know, it's funny how Raj's dish often ends up on those top five worst signature dishes lists just because it's Raj, but truth be told, it's really not the worst out there. Ramsey actually gave credit where credit was due and complimented the seafood, saying that it tasted quite nice. Sure, the presentation was absurd as hell, and that's why it's on this list. I mean, if you call it a pancake, it should at least 
look like a pancake. But getting a quite nice from Gordon Ramsay of all people is no small feat. What do you think? And I wasn't BSing you about vegetable and seafood pancakes being a real thing. It's called okonomiyaki over in Japan, and man, are they delicious. While it's technically not always a mix of seafood and vegetables, shrimp and squid are pretty popular fillings for this savory pancake. And fun fact, the name is derived from the word okonomi, meaning how you like it, or what you like, and yaki, meaning grilled. What's more, many fans have already attempted to recreate the dish. After all, Raj brought it to Hell's Kitchen of all places, so why not? Next up, I'll give you three options to pick from. It was season three, the leftovers challenge, and like the name suggests, the chefs would be put to the test by working with leftovers. The challenge was all about turning previously used ingredients into a dazzling new dish. The teams were tasked with creating one appetizer and two entrees from a tray of identical leftovers, and they had a mere 30 minutes to make it happen. First up in the entree round were Jen and Josh. Jen presented her steak and eggs dish, but Ramsey was far from impressed. He bluntly stated that it looked like something straight out of a workplace cafeteria and that he expected better from her. Half an hour to make that. But Jen had a bit of a revelation herself, realizing that the dish was actually Bonnie's idea and that she should have ventured into something different. On the other side, Josh brought forth his chicken leg with pea tendrils. Unfortunately, Ramsey wasn't pulling his punches here either. He tore into the dish. Just taste that sauce. Oof. It was overly acidic, and to make matters worse, the chicken was undercooked. The sauce is disgusting, yeah, and it is just crap. Ramsey even mentioned that he had higher expectations for Josh, given that he was a professional chef. But he put it bluntly, the dish was terrible. And for those of you born in May, here you go. First challenge, I played it too early, and now I'm plating too late. I mean, half an hour. You're, uh, welcome. In the Seven Seas Seafood Challenge, each chef had the chance to pick a rival from the opposite team to compete against. The twist was that the chosen chef would then select a scroll, each representing a major body of water, which would determine the type of fish they'd have to cook with. Heidi decided to take on Johnny from the men's team, much to his chagrin, as he wasn't exactly a fish expert. Damn you, Heidi! Fish is not my thing. When Johnny picked the Atlantic Ocean scroll, the rest of the challenge was revealed. What will we have to eat? Bluefin tuna! And yeah, they had just 30 minutes to make it all happen. The bluefin tuna round was the first to be judged. When Heidi and Johnny presented their creations, Ramsey couldn't help but ask Johnny what in the world had happened to his bluefin. Look like it's being attacked by a cat. Wow. On the other hand, Heidi's sesame crusted bluefin tuna with a sake Asian stir fry was met with such high praise. Thanks to its elegant presentation, the dish earned her a point. With this, the women took the lead at 1 to 0, leaving Devin clearly frustrated by what he considered another case of Johnny's less than adequate plating skills. Got to start stepping up in these challenges and not repeat the same mistakes. And hey, he wasn't wrong. Previously in the ostrich meat challenge, Johnny took charge of both the ground meat stations. He had clear plans in mind, a deconstructed burger and chili, and he felt pretty confident. After all, he had experience cooking burgers back in his comfort zone, his home kitchen, and believed he would excel in this challenge. It's gonna be a challenge that I am gonna kill. Woo. Being the first to have his dishes evaluated, he faced off against Ryan and Shanna. His initial creation, a deconstructed Hawaiian bacon burger featuring grilled pineapple and bok choy, didn't quite hit the mark and received criticism for even its conceptualization. I'm, I'm perplexed a bit. Badly conceptualized. His second dish, a chipotle chili, also fell short, as it was described as dry and rather uninspiring, with Frederick Moran even comparing it to something pretty unappetizing. Looks a bit dry. It's a bit boring. It's kids' food. 
In the end, Johnny had to accept defeat in this round, losing out to the red team. For those of you born in May, be sure to double check for an extra ingredient in your dish, since Johnny's cooking it. And for me to be standing here right now, I want to rip out the beautiful hair in my head. Yeah, his hair. Sorry. Now, how about moving on to Dana's, uh, award-winning dish? Anything to stop thinking about Johnny's hair? In the Creative Steak Challenge in Season 10, it was all about pitting one member from each team against each other. They had this nifty slot machine to reveal their ingredients, which included the type of steak they'd be working with. Dana and Patrick were the first ones to take a spin, and when Dana gave that lever a yank, out came flat iron steak, potatoes, mushrooms, spinach, and a touch of blue cheese. Sounds great, right? Now, let's talk about what Dana actually made. She whipped up a grilled flat iron steak paired with sauteed spinach and cabernet infused mushrooms. The trouble was, her dish's presentation in the flat iron steak round was a bit of a mess. Yikes. Raj, at least you're in good company. As for Dana, it was a disappointing moment, but she hoped the flavors would at least redeem her dish. Unfortunately though, her hopes were dashed. Oh, and of course, there is the exceptional LA's signature dish. Fish and chips is a signature dish? Who are you, the United <laughs> Kingdom? LA was the ninth chef to have her dish tasted by Ramsay, and like you saw, Ramsay wasn't impressed one bit. I mean, how can you butcher something as simple as that? And a dish so near and dear to Ramsay's heart, no less. Now, next up, I've got a bit of a dilemma about which of these two was better or worse. Maybe you can help me decide between the dishes presented by Manda and Alan in the duck challenge of season 15. Each chef paired up with someone from the other team in a canoe, and they had to snatch five rubber ducks, each sporting a different ingredient, and then rush back to Hell's Kitchen. They had a solid 40 minutes to turn those ducks into delectable dishes. Josiah Citrin, the guest judge, was in the house, and both he and Ramsay were gonna rate these dishes on a scale of one to four. The one with the most points would walk away with the victory. Now, let's break it down. Manda's duck dish didn't quite hit the mark. Her concern was on point. Well, part of it, anyway. It did end up overcooked, and Ramsay didn't hold back, likening the taste to pork. Needless to say, that was a major letdown for Manda, who really hated disappointing Ramsay. She managed to score two points. Then, Alan's dish, featuring duck with deep-fried collard greens, didn't exactly hit the mark either. It ended up being criticized for being too greasy and somewhat bland. Yeah, it looked inedible. He too scored just two points. I mean, even Frank, who had never worked with duck before, even his dish was pretty impressive. Either way, in other words, Alan and Manda just couldn't deliver. You hate to see it. Now, if you want to take revenge on someone, then you gotta have Bonnie's contemporary cheese course on your menu. Ramsay had quite a bit to say about it. In fact, he had a lot to say about it. Ooh, it's different. So you're pretty new at this? Yeah. Yeah, I can see that. It did, but in a bad way. To him, it looked less like a cheese course and more like a deconstructed mango cheesecake. The interesting part was, Ramsay not only found it lacking, but he also made it clear that the dish put Bonnie's inexperience front and center. You can imagine that wasn't exactly music to her ears. Okay. And now, you better brace yourselves for this next dish. In the first half of Season 7's Pork Creation Challenge, Nilka made a determined dash to capture her pork partner. Her eyes were fixed on the bacon collared pig, and she went all out trying to catch it. But this particular swine turned out to be quite the elusive creature. Oh my god! Damn bacon! <laughs> After what can only be described as an exhilarating chase, she finally cornered the one, adorned with a blood sausage collar. Now, when Fran selected prunes, Nilka couldn't help but raise an eyebrow. Prunes didn't exactly scream appetizing to her, and she's not alone. The words blood and sausage might evoke some unsavory mental images, but imagine how those flavors would collide with prunes. 
Jones. I mean, seriously, what was Scott thinking when he paired Nilka and Fran together? As they began cooking, neither of them felt particularly confident because they had never worked with blood sausages before. Not to mention attempting to pair them with prunes of all things. Is it supposed to be mushy? Yeah. I Wait, aren't they supposed to be firm and juicy? Things quickly took a disappointing turn when they pulled their creation out of the oven. It was a complete flop, and they both knew it. Nilka felt a sinking feeling in her stomach, and Scott chimed in, suggesting they should have pricked those sausages before cooking. Later, when it was time to plate their dishes, Nilka and Fran were the only ones who didn't wear a confident expression. When Ramsay tasted their dish, well, let's just say the swine-inspired dining experience was far from perfect, and leave it at that, okay? <sighs> Nilka, clearly unimpressed from the start, spilled the beans and admitted she wasn't pleased with what they had done. But a furious Ramsay demanded answers. Fran shot daggers at Scott, the one who had the initial idea but conveniently kept quiet, refusing to take responsibility. Uh, sorry for the bad pun. You see, I needed to break the tense moments. Meanwhile, Nilka boldly declared she'd prefer to serve an empty plate. But Ramsay was in no mood to give them any slack. The dish was a complete disaster. Although, let's be honest, it didn't look very appealing from the start. Now, did it? Now, for those of you who don't know, the next signature dish is apparently Ramsay's absolute favorite. It's fine. Virginia's dish was a coconut and pomegranate celery root salad. But before you celebrate too early, let me paint the full picture for you. She might have seemed promising at first, but the reality was quite different. It's fine. As far as rabbit food goes, because it's all raw and crunchy. In all honesty, she got exactly what she deserved. Her plate contained nothing that had been cooked. Instead, during those critical 30 minutes, all she did was toast some nuts. And I know it's a good salad. A rabbit might like it. I don't, I don't think rabbits like coconut milk. Okay, let's spice things up, shall we? And when I say spicy, I mean dishes that were too hot for even Ramsay to handle. First, Jessica's Cajun Crabs. Cook slightly Cajun style with a spicy aioli. Aioli's very hot. Then there's Nilka's Chicken Wings with a bottle full of Tabasco. Jesus, That's gonna blow your ass about that. Burn my mouth. Nobody gets a Or how about Maribel's Argentine Plantain Soup? Yeah, and this one couldn't take any criticism of her dish. Well, at least nobody got Antonia's gumbo. So, which is the most absurd dish you've come across on the show? Make sure to drop them in the comments. Ramsey should be given a medal for sacrificing his health for our entertainment. I mean, some of these dishes are absolutely repulsive. Guess which dish had the great chef hurl his guts out? Like this. And hey, fair warning. Don't watch this video while having dinner. Well, let's continue from where I left off, shall we? Okay, so this is the exotic tartare dish by Matt Siegel from season four. He was boasting to the cameras about how his dish was gonna rock Ramsay's world. And I think it did, but not in a way he was expecting. So what was so exotic about it, do you ask? It was a mind-boggling combo of raw venison, diver scallops, caviar, and wait for it, grated white chocolate. Ramsay couldn't believe his ears and questioned if he was being punked. I mean, what were you smoking to come up with this combination? Man, I got secondhand embarrassment watching this. Oh, that was ruthless. Now, you'd think this would bring Matt's ego down a notch, right? Well, think again. Matt, bless his heart, couldn't comprehend what Ramsay found so repulsive about his creation. The poor guy was genuinely perplexed. To be fair, Matt, you put white chocolate on seafood. Like, white chocolate on seafood. Duh! Does that ring a bell, or should I ring it for you? But at least Matt cooked it through. But was that near hat trick of screw-ups more embarrassing than what Kashia from season 12 had to go through? During the 160th sorority anniversary planning challenge, the Southern-themed menu got Kashia excited. I am from the South. That's all we eat every day, soul food. So I know we got this one. 
and she wasted no time in taking charge to showcase her leadership skills and demonstrate her expertise with southern flavors. Kashia presented the red team's chicken entree and was the first to have her dish judged, facing off against Jason. Her dish featured classic fried chicken paired with mac and cheese, collard greens, ham, and hot sauce. Sounds southern to me. While she got points for the collard greens and mac and cheese, it didn't hold up to Jason's dish, a crunchy double breaded leg and thigh with mushroom gravy and mashed potatoes, and a little cheddar cheese for good measure. I'm shocked right now. I thought the chicken was on point, but apparently it wasn't good enough. It's just very frustrating. So Kashio was responsible for the fried chicken station during service, working alongside Jessica. When Ramsey asked how long the chicken was going to take, she seemed confident, having fried chicken many times before. I cook chicken a hundred times. I eat plenty of chicken. Unfortunately, the initial batch turned out raw, and she asked for another two minutes to cook it properly, much to everyone's disappointment. Fried on chicken. Her opening and closing the oven door over and over again prompted Ramsey to intervene and give her a quick lesson in basic thermodynamics. The situation escalated when she sent up undercooked chicken, leading Ramsey to angrily pull her and Jessica into the pantry for an explanation. It's pink and it's raw. Both of you, come here. Yes, chef. Yes. Kashia was deeply embarrassed, and for good reason, considering how dangerous raw chicken is, and asked Jessica for her support. No, chef, I'm not. Chef, the breasts are this, it's only the breasts, like the group. Get them in early! Yes, yes chef. chef. Kasia had Jessica check the chicken, since Southern cooking held a special place in her heart. Unfortunately, Jessica brought up raw chicken again, despite believing it was cooked. Ramsey gave them a final warning threatening to send them both packing if they came up with more excuses. So, how many Southern cooks does it take to make fried chicken? Well, more than Jessica and Kasia, at least. But anyway, Tiffany's behavior was honestly quite frustrating. She had this tendency to get drunk and spread rumors, which made everything worse and caused unnecessary tension and conflict within the team. Like, really. She was HK's very own devil. What really got to me was her hypocrisy, which ranks in my top three of her worst traits. She claimed to hate kids and believed they wouldn't appreciate fine dining, as if that justified serving them burnt pizza. I really hate cooking for children. Kids don't know what fine dining is, so their opinions really don't matter to me. Yet, around the same time, she decided to mock the blue team for screwing up their dinner service. It got so bad that the red team had to step in and defend them. That led Tiffany to think the rest of them were beneath her, as she continued to taunt them, even in the dorms. Here's how you treated me. You're here, I'm here. Ba, 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 ba. Don't do that. She continued to insist that they shouldn't be concerned about their pride and should only focus on the customers. It's not about you in this competition, it's about the fucking customer and the food. Do you realize that? Funny you say that, Tiffany. Here's the thing, those kids you dismissed, they're customers too, and they deserve as good a dining experience as anybody else. Remember that potato dish? But honestly, I couldn't call it a dish in good faith. It honestly looks like it could have hurt somebody. I mean, Tiffany's double standards really didn't sit well with me. Let's take a look at the second dinner service. Shall we? She put her manipulativeness front and center by deliberately sending out an incomplete order of scallops just to shift the blame onto Barbie and make her look incompetent. And she only did this because of a personal grudge, rather than out of genuine concern for the team's performance. Here you go, Barbie. I'll just throw you under the bus because that's where you belong. She was also straight up dishonest, like when she suggested firing up extra sea bass for insurance. Why don't we fire like four more fucking bass right now? Hey. News flash, here in Hell's Kitchen, they cook Dory to order. She also deflected blame onto her teammates when confronted by Ramsey, and the entire team got yelled at instead. To top it off, she acted like it wasn't even her fault in the first place. I don't understand why I'm getting yelled at. I'm trying to fucking put out food for the customer. I mean, I'm pissed off that he's mad at me. And I mean, teamwork and cooperation were completely foreign concepts to her. Yeah, she was nasty, with a capital M, no doubt and her relentless, unwarranted hate towards Barbie has been called out over and over again by fans of the show for being borderline racist. No, I'm not about to get fucking choked out. I'm not about to get choked out, you dumb God, it 
pisses me off even talking about it. Remember this incident from season 5? So Royce started complaining about Mexican cuisine, making stereotypical comments about flour tortillas, and even suggesting he could make better tacos than Kimmy, a Memphis native. Wow. I will not let it happen again. Tiffany, who had earlier advocated for a no-bitching policy, jumped right in to keep the chaos going. She then got super drunk on a bunch of wine and laid it out clear as day to Kimmy and Robin. Mother was like, what? God, if somebody wanted to make a director's cut of this season that completely wrote Tiffany out, I'd watch it in a heartbeat. But anyway, I absolutely agreed with Brian when he said this. Cruel and unusual punishment to have to look at her and I'm done with her. So instead of addressing the issue constructively, she used Royce's complaints to pin the blame on Danielle, Dana, and Christina. Like, way to throw them under the bus for something they didn't even say. You are in. Sadly, for the most difficult punishment in the history of Hell's Kitchen. This kind of behavior was nothing short of mean and bitchy, and it seriously jeopardized the team's dynamic for the upcoming service. Like, hello, this isn't high school. All in all, her attitude sucked. And it's not like her performance was any better. Oh, but she made sure to criticize Barbie's chicken cooking skills every chance she got. Cooking a rest of chicken is, is about as easy as taking a shit. Anybody can do it. Are you that dumb? But the sad part is that she fucked up something as simple as mashed potatoes. Yes, Put sir. that down. Look at me. Shit, burn, mash. Get out. Get out! But to the relief of Hell's Kitchen fans around the globe, that overconfidence was what ultimately sunk her. Pride cometh before the fall. But hey, before I leave her alone, let's fondly remember the time sous chef Andy called her out for her poor attitude. Tiffany, sorry. No, you're fucking not. Yes, I am. You're the floppiest cook I've ever seen my whole entire life. Sorry. Oh yeah, she was a huge mess. And oh, by the way, did you know that she's married now? And she took her partner's last name. And oh boy, you won't believe what it is. Tiffany Gross. Which, I mean, could you imagine a more fitting last name considering she did this? Tiffany, what the fuck are you doing? And this. And this. Good job, burping. <laughs> See what I mean? You have such a fucking attitude. Why don't you take a walk and Dana take over her section? Yes, chef. chef. And congrats, by the way, that makes you the only contestant to this date to be kicked out of the kitchen by a sous chef. Did she have any shame? Uh, apparently not. On her way back to the dorms, Tiffany seemed upset that her teammates had made her look bad. Yeah, even then, she refused to take accountability. Unlike this next contestant who was so overconfident that he ended up not cooking his dish enough. In season 11, episode 10, during the quinceanera planning challenge, John Scallion had a word with Michael Langdon, reminding him to ensure that his meat was prepared in time since the clock was ticking away. Determined, Michael took charge and prepared a steak dish, becoming the final contender from the blue team to present his creation up for judgment. He was up against Amanda Giblet, and Ramsay actually liked her dish. Michael, however, felt that his flavors were superior. But were they? Let's hear it. You know what they call that? Bald-faced lies. Upon closer inspection, it was evident that the steak was severely undercooked. Oh, the horror. Blood still lingered on the plate, signaling that the dish was far from being ready. While Michael insisted it wasn't blood, the truth was hard to ignore. I mean, what do you think this is? His dish was promptly criticized for its raw and undercooked state, much to Michael's frustration. I don't know about you, but this made me throw up, and I think I can't eat steaks for a few weeks now. Not exaggerating even a bit. And by the way, I had a field day learning about all the bacteria that raw meat is contaminated with. When ingested, they can make you really sick. Like, really, really sick. I am talking diarrhea, stomach cramps, vomiting, and a fever, as per the CDC. This can strike between 6 and 24 hours after eating raw, undercooked meat. And it lasts between 24 hours and many days, depending on the type of bacteria. So yeah, 
Chef Michael, for the sake of your family's health, I hope you're only taking over grilling duties whenever there's a barbecue. That reminds me, Devin also flopped during the Southern Cuisine Challenge in season 16. Man, I'm from the South. I am very comfortable with Southern food. Now, I really like the guy. Season 16's blue team was filled to the brim with awful people, and Devin was like a breath of fresh air. He had more talent than he was given credit for, but that didn't stop him from screwing this challenge up. He was paired up against Kimberly from the red team, and their task was to prepare a trout dish. During the cooking process, Devin suggested to Johnny that they use some spicy seasoning to give the dish a kick, and he was confident that they would absolutely ace the challenge. Go spicy? Yeah. Yeah, give it a little bit of spice. Right over like a sh shredded mash with onions and peppers, yeah? Mashed potatoes definitely sell, but make sure they're a garlic mash. Though. Garlic, cut, right? Still, Johnny's dish somehow ended up bland. When it was time for Devin to present his take on it, he offered up a trout with black-eyed pea succotash and corn bacon fried okra. The expectation was that he would shine, given his southern roots. However, the breading proved to be his undoing. In the south is everywhere, but these are overbreaded. Ramsey pointed out that this mistake made it difficult to distinguish the trout from any other fish, stripping away its identity. That could be any fish in there. With Devin not earning any points, the blue team fell short with a final score of two to three. So we're apparently gonna need more people than Devin, Jessica, and Kasia if we want some down-home cooking in Hell's Kitchen. But lo and behold, this next chef is the definition of a sore loser. I'm gonna definitely blackball you guys because you got fuck me so royally tonight. That's the runner-up of season eight, threatening to exclude his finale brigade from any work in whatever cities he'd be in. What a great display of maturity and sportsmanship, huh? The HK community has christened him as Russell, and you'll soon see why. High schoolers can be pretty annoying, but hey, nothing justifies a grown-ass man stooping to bullying, just because he was in a bad mood about losing the prom planning challenge. We're doing this for you. How about you back up a little bit? This is not a joke. I'm not here to play. If I didn't know any better, I'd think it was his prom that they'd ruined. Anyway, let me spell something out for you. Threats aren't an appropriate response to instructions, even if they were constant. At all. Also, in their defense, he did a pretty bad job at decorating. I'm not doing this for my 15 minutes of fame. I'm doing this for a fucking career, so step off. Boy, watch your language. I'm a grown-ass man. Bro, they are your customers, and flipping out on them is proof enough that he could not handle being Ramsey's head chef. Like I said, the dude was a bully, so unnecessarily aggressive. Now, we know how Russell felt about Trev, right? He's just like a zit on your ass, and you want to pop the motherfucker, but you know it's going to hurt and you can't reach it. That's Trevor. The dude couldn't help himself from micromanaging the guy, and later admitted to sabotaging him. Oh, dude, that's way too, it's way too what? You can't do it on the heat. Yeah, on the corner. This is exactly how Chef Scott told me how to do it yesterday. But did you take it down to syrup? Yes. Come on, that's not a good look, man. See, I'm not the biggest Trev fan, but even I felt sorry for him when Russell threatened to assault him. You talked to me like you talked to me before about that salmon? I would have slapped the shit out of you. Well, he definitely crossed the line there. Lost all my respect, that's for sure. Not that he had it in the first place, but... Anyway, Russell's arrogance was put center stage throughout his time on the show, and it wasn't winning him any fans. Moreover, remember how he blamed it all on his team for losing the finale? I chose the team that I wanted, and I thought they would help me win, and in fact, they helped me lose, so... You know how bullies seek out power because they feel powerless themselves? Case in point, Russell. In the end, Russell's talent as a chef was overshadowed by his abusive behavior and arrogance. No amount of skill would ever make anybody want to work with him. Now it's time to meet Krissa Schmerler. She may have seemed kind-hearted, but let's just say Hell's Kitchen wasn't exactly her cup of tea. Spoiler alert, in the 14th season, she landed a not-so-impressive 18th place. So that should tell you a lot about her culinary expertise. She presented a ginger-crusted chicken breast during the signature dish challenge inspired by, wait for it, the cookie aisle at the grocery store. Yep, you heard that right. Ramsey couldn't help himself and covered his face, bursting into uncontrollable laughter. And guess what? 
the entire audience joined in, turning poor Chris's moment into an awkward laugh fest. Oh, the embarrassment. Ramsey couldn't help but make a cheeky remark. I mean, he couldn't even manage to swallow one bite. Clearly, that was an abomination, and she just scored one point out of five. To make matters worse, Krissa even told the cameras that she's not used to people spitting out her food. Honestly, I felt bad for her here. Tough break, Krissa. But what you served was simply inedible. Oh, but here comes a self-proclaimed pizza lover, Clemenza, who tanked the immigration lunch service challenge. Come on, I ate a lot of pizza in my life. My family actually owned the pizzeria. Despite feeling right in his element, he served up a raw pizza. And that little misstep ended up stalling the entire blue kitchen. You should be able to nail a New York style pizza. This is a joke. Despite his Italian heritage, Italian night didn't go his way. But before I get to that, during prep, he hyped up the importance of the evening. And just coming through, baby. Stand back, step off, watch out. But he wasn't practicing what he was preaching with how he was brutalizing the chicken. Mr. Italiano takes it upon himself to pound the chicken breasts like this big. Sous Chef Scott was taken aback, as none of the chicken had been prepared that way the day before. Why did we do this? I don't know what to do. I really don't. I have no idea. He f***ed them all, so I don't know what you guys want to do. Sometime later, Clemenza was assigned to the appetizer station alongside Barbie. As the service began, Ramsey emphasized that he was really counting on him. Yes, Chef, if there's ever a night for you to shine, yes, chef. it's tonight. Tonight is your night, let's go. But even with Ramsey's words hanging in the air, he still couldn't be bothered to pay attention. What were the appetizers at that table, Clemenza? <laughs> Clemenza, what were the appetizers on that I, table? I didn't hear it, Chef. An irritated Christina had to urge him to step up or step off. And Clemenza's troubles were only just beginning. Since he missed yet another call out, Ramsey even ordered Clemenza to call out the order himself. In the end, Clemenza was slow in picking the shrimp. And as a result, one of the tables was left hanging. It definitely was surprising to see Clemenza struggle like that, especially on Italian night. Not surprising why he was eliminated that episode. This next contestant was irredeemable. Stop acting like a baby girl. I can't even wrap my head around how infuriating Scott Lee's relentlessness towards Trev was. With that baby girl nickname of his. I mean, every time. Every damn time he opened his mouth to insult Trev, it was something sexist. God, they pulled Trev out of retirement for this? Trading one bully for another. Again, like we learned with Russell, I don't care how good you are in the kitchen, if you're an asshole. How is he so unsympathetic to Trev's allergic reaction and taunting him for it? It's We're prima donna at, man. He's still getting his <laughs> looked at. <laughs> You all right, baby girl? It's not like he could control it. What was wrong with the rest? Especially Jose. It's pretty shocking that someone who claimed family meant everything to him would encourage behavior like that. He had to know that Trev was uncomfortable with it. Oh, you're saying that you guys took care of all this without me? Yeah, baby girl, got your back. I see how it is. It's ironic because Jose always seemed so intense on being a hero to his family but he ended up being just as much of a villain as Scott Lee. Like, I mean, if a good person allows a bully to bully, you've got two bullies. By the way, this reminds me of something similar that happened in season 16, when Jessica Boynton nervously took her place as the eighth contestant against Andrew Pierce from the red team to face Ramsey's judgment. Little did she know that her risotto dish was about to take an unexpected turn. Ah, uh, it's okay, chefs. Spit happens. I, I mean, shit happens. And this is no big deal in Hell's Kitchen, as each and every day turns out to be a learning experience. Moving on to the Mexican Cuisine Challenge in Season 19, where both teams were tasked with elevating four classic Mexican dishes, tacos, tostadas, enchiladas, and chili relleno. This challenge was particularly intriguing because it brought together Mary Lou and Corey, the two finalists of the season, giving us the pleasure of witnessing a legendary team up. Corey's got the most experience out of all of us and she got the most experience cooking Mexican food. They decided to take on the chili relleno and enchiladas, a promising pairing given Corey's Latin background and Mary Lou's Southern Tex-Mex flair. 
her southern Tex-Mex kind of flavor, my Latin background. Dude, we're gonna be a dynamic duo here. Yeah, that's what everyone expected. Corey even mentioned how naturally this cuisine came to her, thanks to her grandma showing her a thing or two. This is what my, my bread and butter is, so it's definitely one that's, uh, <laughs> this is definitely one that I'm gonna, I'm gonna win for you, Grandma, for sure. But to my surprise, and I'm sure everybody else's, they completely flopped. Right in front of MasterChef judge, Aron Sanchez. And boy, was he not happy about it. Here's the deal, you can look at it and visually, there's some there's some real issues with it. The guy had to see his culture and their culture completely massacred. It had no color, way too much cheese, and most damningly, the enchilada completely crumbled apart. While Aron did commend the mole sauce for its flavor, he couldn't help but mention how poor a fit it was for an enchilada. So it should come to nobody's surprise that they lost this round handedly leaving Corey feeling pretty distraught. Well, sometimes things just don't work out, I guess. Anyway, moving on, it's crazy how we got to see so many different personalities on Hell's Kitchen. Apart from Jason Underwood and Frank Kala, this next contestant was one of the rare few that had a shit personality, both on the show and outside the show. I'll fix it right now, So give me a proper fresh lobster towel. Get it. Yeah, I understand. So concentrate. Okay, sir. You should see the blatant racism he had for Hassan on Facebook. And thankfully, people had the presence of mind to call him out on it. The show only proved how thick-headed the guy was. Criticism just bounced off of him like he had a force field for the stuff. He never showed a single second of genuine self-reflection. Only a lot of blustering and putting on a show. It's astonishing how many opportunities he had to learn from some real top-notch chefs and industry leaders. Like, hello, Ramsey's right there. Instead, he chose to dig his heels in and deny their expertise, acting like he knew better in spite of all the years they had on him. Remember his comment after losing the creative sliders challenge? What the f do they know? That's why they're running burger joints. Yeah, I'm sure Ramsey and Christina Wilson work at McDonald's. I saw them at the one down the street from me. And just look at him constantly bitching and talking back to the judges. Like, he had so much growing up to do. So a lobster roll is a lobster roll, and then a slider is something completely... I didn't say it was a lobster roll, because it's made with shrimp, obviously. Is this a slider? To me, it is, Chef. To you, it's not. He really thought he did something revolutionary by refusing to accept any feedback. If I asked you for love's raw, would you do me a slider? <laughs> slider is. Like, you knew he was trouble from the very first service. Matt's behavior on the fish station was nothing short of immature, and when he and Andrew got into an argument over the scallops, things took a turn for the worse. When Ramsey found out that the scallops were raw, he blamed Andrew for it and suggested checking camera footage for evidence. And I have to say this, Ramsey's reaction was entirely warranted. If I hear you talk about a camera one more time, I'll stick a GoPro up so you can see how you are. Sorry, bro, this is Hell's Kitchen. We don't break the fourth wall here. And what do you know? Wanna be Eminem here? Even challenge Ramsey to a fight during his elimination confessional. If I was on the street right now and he came up to me with that same I'd him up. Seriously, how low can you go? But this time, someone decided to teach Ramsey a few things. And that's when we meet Miss Manners. That would be Colleen Cleek. Her misguided confidence and overpriced instruction made her infamous. And did I mention that she was a cooking instructor despite not being formally trained? I can almost hear the collective gasp and see the raised eyebrows in the room. And how much does she charge? I don't think you're ready for this. How much do you charge? 300 per three to four hours. Wait. What? So she's not a trained chef herself, but she charges that outrageous amount to teach what exactly? Does she mean people pay her for this? Her signature dish was smoked chicken enchiladas with poblano cream sauce, and it was an epic culinary fail. You can guess how bad it was when Ramsey says this. You seriously charge $300 to teach people how to make that crap? Needless to say, he wasn't impressed, and neither is the internet. 
Colleen, already in a precarious situation, struggled to keep her mouth shut. But she couldn't resist the temptation and blurted out this. I teach manners too, chef. Oh god, the audacity. She really thought she owned GR, huh? But everyone's a gangsta until Ramsey says, Okay, please, Miss Manners, fuck off back in line. Obviously, she couldn't, and a frustrated Ramsey told her to step back in line. Now, that's what I call a total disaster, folks. But this cultural butchering pales in comparison to what happened with Brett. Now, you'd expect everybody's favorite Italian to be able to make a perfect calzone in his sleep. But the International Cheese Challenge in Season 14 proved otherwise. He found himself facing off against T, who wasn't intimidated at all. And he's all like, I'm the fucking Italian. Get the tattoo on my chest. And Nick also wasn't convinced of his ability. Brett's so excited to get a calzone, and it's Italian, and he's Italian, we all get it. Prosciutto de Parma. Just shut up. It's really annoying. In spite of it all, though, Brett eagerly announced his vision for the perfect calzone. Uh, caprese uh, calzone with a little twist of prosciutto de Parma and soprasate. Then, with just eight minutes left, disaster struck. The bottom of his calzone was absolutely destroyed because of how thin his dough was. But hey, Brett wasn't ready to give up just yet. He quickly switched gears, moved his tasty filling into a fresh dough base, and popped it back into the pizza oven, hoping for a comeback. When it was finally time for Ramsey to taste his dish, Brett proudly presented his take on a traditional calzone. It had roasted peppers, heirloom tomatoes, and pomodoro cheese. Ramsey liked the flavors inside, but he couldn't let the raw dough slide. Chef, underneath, that is raw, and it's too bad, because had that been in for another two minutes, then you'd be leaving Hell's Kitchen for an amazing day. I imagine nobody's gonna be surprised when I say T ran away with this round. No? Good. Remember this episode in season three where Jen Yamola went dumpster diving? Yep, she retrieved the spaghetti she had thrown out in the garbage and proceeded to wash it. She almost actually cooked it again and claimed she would have served it too. That's easily one of the worst food offenses. So what happened is that Joanna Dunn was about to kill someone by serving rancid crab. So Ramsey threw her out and put Jen and Julia on the appetizer station. They were able to get some dishes out, but after she tossed out cooked spaghetti which she thought were not needed, what do you know? Ramsey asked for some on the very next ticket. In a panic, she grabbed some tossed spaghetti from the trash, but all thanks to Julia who stopped Jen dead in her tracks with absolutely no hesitation at all. At least someone was thinking straight. Indeed. Jen's lucky Ramsey didn't catch her. The comments on the Hell's Kitchen channel show how angry the viewers were. Some believe that she should have been 86th from the show after this incident. Others question that if she was willing to do this on camera, imagine what her hygiene standards are when nobody's watching. Yeah, food for thought, right? I can't understand what it is with all these contestants taking shortcuts. And here comes another one. You absolutely cannot cook a proper gumbo in 45 minutes. But Antonia Bregman from season eight tried anyway. As you would expect, her Mardi Gras gumbo turned out to be a culinary catastrophe of epic proportions. When she proudly unveiled the dish to Ramsey, it was met with sheer shock and disbelief. Despite describing it as a plate of liquid shit, he bravely took a bite. What could go wrong, right? Well, everything. It was inedible. Even people on the internet are convinced that it must have tasted like actual shit or worse. And then this happened. Have you tasted that? No, I didn't get a chance to taste it, chef. Seriously? Who in their right mind wouldn't taste their own dish before getting it judged by Ramsey? That's a risky move in a high stakes competition like Hell's Kitchen. To add insult to injury, Ramsey decided to subject the rest of the contestants to Antonia's gastro adventure. If it wasn't already bad that he got sick. And now, he decided to share that misery with Antonia's competitors. To put it mildly, none of them were impressed. Rob took the opportunity to unleash his creative criticism, saying this. It was completely repulsive. I would have rather had a cat shit in my mouth than I've eaten that any further. Nona and Boris weren't faring any better. 
with the flavors threatening to send them over the edge. Even Vinny couldn't find any redeeming qualities, likening it to slurping down a big ol' bowl of mud. Easily one of the worst, most repulsive dishes served on the show. If hell is real, I am sure in the ninth circle, they make you eat this. Obviously, she earned no points, and Ramsey declared it as the worst dish of the day, leading the red team to lose the signature dish challenge. And what a way to lose a challenge. Now, do you remember Kimmy always saying, I'm from the South, I grew up in the hood, I'm from Memphis, Tennessee only to be eliminated on Southern Night. During the challenge, she was even bragging about it. I got a banging ass plate, man. I know Brian's about to go down with my plate. Uh. When her turn came, she confidently presented her creation, an oregano panko crusted pork chop accompanied by creamy grits and infused with sauteed bacon and Monterey cheese. However, Ramsey didn't find a lot of value in how dull it was. Ramsey always gives me criticism on my plating. Dude, just taste it. Shit. Surprisingly, despite the rocky start, her dish still managed to earn praise for its delicious grits. So much so that they carried her to a win against Brian. As the Southern Night dinner service kicked off, she found herself at the fish station. If there's one person that should be absolutely key to the success of the red team tonight, it should be you. Um, that didn't happen. Despite this. Super stoked for tonight because this is what I do every day of my life but yet I'm nervous. First, she served up burnt catfish, in spite of both how easy it is to cook and how much it was in her wheelhouse. It's supposed to be from the South. You cannot cook, period. <laughs> she struggled with the refire too. Oh, whoa. She even hit another snag when an oil bubble popped in her face, which uh, I can at least empathize with. Despite the burn, she managed to get the refire accepted. However, due to her earlier mistake, the red team had fallen behind. To make matters worse, her catfish dishes on this round ended up both raw and burnt, a double whammy that destroyed what little was left of Ramsey's sanity. Come here, you. Let me show you something. I've got raw, raw catfish there. Oh. Then there's burnt He was trying so hard to hold back tears there. You hate to see it. Oh, I could cry. I could just, I could just cry. Stop! Well, we're jumping from one poor excuse for a person to another. Or two, because I couldn't decide if Aaron or Steve was the worst villain of season 13. They're both on my list because of their bitter, obnoxious attitude towards our man, Mr. 100. Sir, if you don't get the fuck away from me, I'm gonna beat the living fuck. And like, leave Sterling alone, my dude. Dude's just having a good time and cooking up some great food. The key ingredient I used was love. <laughs> Agreed. Nobody, not even Ramsey, could go that far in his career if he didn't love cooking. But Aaron just had to be a pick me. Guess what? Love's not a fucking ingredient, asshole. And don't even get me started on how he was playing the martyr during his plea. As much as I'd love to run a restaurant for you, I'd love to be a Michelin star chef, but I don't think winning Hell's Kitchen is actually going to get me any closer to my goal. Oh, Aaron, you really outdid yourself on that one. So you decided to quit the competition because you were well aware that your lackluster performances were leading straight to elimination. Huh? How brave. A tactical retreat, right? And, oh, let's not forget that absolutely pathetic excuse you came up with. I mean, seriously, anyone in their right mind would consider themselves lucky to be mentored by THE Gordon Ramsay. How could that not lead to so many new doors opening up for you? But he was just a weaselly little man who gave up the second the going got tough. I think you would have learned a lot more here. And you're not willing to fight for it. Remember how at one point he labeled half of his teammates dead weight and conspired with Steve to undermine them? So I don't want the downers on our crew. You know, honestly, I say we just tell us what Yeah. This is coming from a guy who served raw scallops, despite being shown how to cook them. Wow, I have no words. But here's what I do have words for. Both of them loved kissing each other's asses. He was so unnecessarily petty. Like, despite losing the dog show planning challenge to Sterling, he called that winning dish of his no better than fast food. If I had to describe Sterling's crab cake in one word, it'd be fast food. 
You can see even the HK editors were having none of his attitude. Well, Sterling was fast, and, well, he did serve food, so I guess he was half right. Shout out to all the editors in the world. The ones working on Hell's Kitchen for sure, and mine. Well, moving on again. This next chef had a terrible decline as season 12 progressed. Like one viewer pointed out, he quickly let his misogyny show once he was transferred to the red team. Any guesses? Yeah, that's Anton for ya. It's been like 10 years since I've worked with a girl in the kitchen. Women are more sensitive than men. Girls do get offended a lot easier. Funny how for some people, sensitivity means weakness, cowardice, or vulnerability. For Anton too. He saw it as super feminine and, in his eyes, somehow inferior. But let's put this into perspective. Men who assume that women are quick to take offense might actually be more worried that these women won't put up with their sexist remarks or won't find their shitty jokes funny. It's not about women being overly sensitive. It's more about these men fearing that they won't be able to get away with everything anymore. He was also so creepy. First with his comments about the sorority girls, which many of you guys pointed out too. I got all these sorority girls coming running out from every door, all different directions. And how he objectified Olympic figure skater Rachel Flat during one of the rewards. I'm not big on ice skating, but I'm an ass man. And the girl definitely has a little booty on her. Yikes. Just. Yikes. Fed up with Aaron's repeated mistakes in his last service, Ramsey finally let him have it for overcooking the Wellingtons. Anton, however, insisted that it was the oven's fault, claiming it was different from the one in the blue kitchen. An explanation that was so ridiculous and hard to believe that, well, nobody believed it. Like, I've mentioned it before, and I still don't get it. Despite sous chef Andy's attempt to explain that she had already coached the red team on the oven's correct settings, Anton dismissively refused her guidance simply because she was a woman. Normally for next door, it's 18 minutes, you're five minutes on the side. I let it rest for another five minutes. Stop yelling at me. I've told them it's 14 minutes. Yeah, that actually happened. As the tension escalated, Anton seemed hell-bent on provoking sous chef Andy by asserting that he had everything under control. Don't think I'm gonna let some little girl get in my face. Like, hello? The little girl in question is one of Gordon Ramsay's most trusted sous chefs. Start ripping a new ass because you got issues on being a woman in the kitchen. No, Anton. I think you have issues with women in the kitchen. And I'm just going to piss you off more on purpose. Jeez, I absolutely can't stand this guy. Not gonna lie, though, I enjoyed every single second of sous chef Andy ripping him apart. Don't you talk back to me! Don't you ever I'm not talk back to me! Back to yes, you are! Pull it together! He simply had a hard time accepting or respecting female authority, and I don't think he would have ever spoken to Ramsey like that. You guys are right. He was nothing if not a chauvinist prick. I think I'd spontaneously combust out of embarrassment if I had to present something as hideous as this. Wow. Props to Jen to stand there and take in all the criticism without hurling excuses because she had nothing to do with that lame-ass duck breast. That was all on Melissa Furpo. You see, what happened is during the wedding planning challenge in season three, Melissa proposed a change that left everyone raising their eyebrows. Instead of sticking with lamb, she suggested the women should go quackers and use duck as the main dish. Jen, being the cautious one, expressed concerns about cooking time but the team ultimately went with Melissa's decision because she was being very bossy about it. How I wish they didn't, but the damage was done. When it came to preparing the duck breast, Julia confidently decided to sear it. However, Melissa quacked in with a different idea, leaving poor Julia feeling a bit plucked. Not only that, Melissa also managed to throw a few feathers at Bonnie Moorhead along the way. It was enough to make anyone feel a bit ruffled, with conflicting instructions taking flight in the kitchen. Amidst all the squabbling, Julia took the duck breast out of the oven to let it rest. But in a moment of kitchen confusion, she accidentally placed it right back in to keep it warm. What followed was more squawking and bickering. Even Rock, with his keen ears, couldn't help but hope that the feathery argument between the Hell's Bietches would lead to their downfall. I mean, just look at him, you guys. So, as the cooking reached its crescendo, Julia and Melissa discovered their unfortunate truth. The duck breast was overcooked. But did Melissa take responsibility? Nope. When Ramsey asked both the teams if they were happy, the woman squawked in unison that they were not. 
Julia, pointing her culinary finger, blamed Melissa, claiming she had been acting like a kitchen dictator. Melissa, however, defended herself, asserting that she wasn't trying to juggle everything at once. Ramsey swiftly reminded her that he never appointed her as head chef, emphasizing that the challenge was all about teamwork. It was time to break free from those ducking egos. Th sorry, autocorrect. I think you heard it right, though. As the news broke that the wedding couple would be tasting their creations alongside GR, Melissa's feathers stood on end. She was horrified. Desperately trying to convince GR, dishes should be kept under lock and key. But GR turned a deaf ear to her concerns. The show must go on. It was a humiliating experience for the entire red team. And let's be honest, the blue team winning that challenge, ah, too easy. There was no competition at all. And well, Rock kinda already knew about this outcome, right? He was just as confident as Royce Wagner during the intense four ingredient challenge in season 10. The only difference being, Royce Wagner's confidence backfired. You see, Royce had set his sights on the luxurious lobster as the star of his dish. His masterpiece? A whole poached lobster infused with saffron and thyme. After taking a bite of his own creation, he seemed very convinced that it was freaking delicious. As the final blue team member to face the judges, Royce squared off against Christina Wilson. Little did he know, a hairy situation was about to unfold. Douglas Keane discovered this. A long hair lurking within the dish sent shockwaves of disgust through the room. An irritated Clemenza Caserta couldn't help but ask why anyone would dare to serve a hair-infested dish to a Michelin star chef. Yeah, pretty gross, right? Ramsey, never one to mince his words, demanded an explanation from Royce. Royce, perplexed and caught off guard, claimed innocence, insisting he had no idea how the hair found its way into his creation. But wait, there was more. Michael Simarusti, like a culinary detective, revealed that the lobster still had its not-so-appetizing shit sack intact. Yikes, there goes my appetite for dinner. Clearly, Royce's dish fell short of expectations. He managed to score only three stars, leaving the team astounded. Meanwhile, Kimmy, in a moment of pure disbelief, couldn't help but ask this. Royce just served hair and a shit sack to Michelin star chefs? Like, what the f are you thinking, dude? Same question, Kimmy. I have the same bloody question. However, in season 11, Dan mistakenly believed that he had an advantage in the Chinese dish creation challenge because of this. I lived in Asia for a year. I am getting my jack back today. Big risks equal big rewards. Oh yeah, he was on probation and had to earn back his jacket. But I can't help but wonder, where in Asia did he live? Japan? China? Russia? Now, just because he lived in Asia for a year doesn't mean he's a master of the cuisine. But Dan was confident. This is not gonna be hard. These ingredients pick themselves. I can't this up. So confident, in fact, that he somehow managed to undercook rice, like the bedrock of all Asian cuisine. Now, in the initial part of the challenge, his enthusiasm grated on Ray, as he incessantly questioned which ingredient should go where. Dan, he's asking me a lot of questions. I thought you went to Asia. Why are you asking me? Good point, though. Anyway, it was during the second part of the challenge when Dan was tasked with responsibility over the fried rice. As the first member of the blue team to have his dish judged, he was convinced that his extensive time in Asia would secure his victory. I'm getting my jacket back right now. Because I lived in Asia for a year. What do you eat while you live in Asia for a year? Asian food. He finally presented a dish of fried rice with mushrooms, coconut milk, peanuts, and sweet and spicy prawns. While the presentation was decent, there was a significant issue. The rice a little bit undercooked. Chinese rice should never be undercooked. That is simply embarrassing. In the end, Dan lost the round to Jacqueline, and Anthony couldn't resist a playful jab. Hey Dan, go back to Asia for another year. 
and rightly so. Now, if you can think of some more really uh, special specialties, don't forget to drop them in the comments below. And if you enjoyed this video, make sure to hit that like, subscribe, and turn on my post notifications. Also, don't forget to check out my latest video right here. It's even crazier.